So today we continue the sequence, the series of Balzan lectures with Sebastian, Professor Sebastiano Bernuzzi from Vienna University on numerical relativity. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation and the um, nice period here. The last two weeks, three weeks have been very nice. Um, yeah, so this will be an introduction on numerical relativity. It will be basics, so, uh, and not for mathematicians. So it will be for physicists mostly, and hopefully uh, also mathematically correct, but not super, super rigorous. Um, I will start with uh, uh, a few slides, then I'll stop, use the blackboard, and then in the second part I will conclude again using, uh, using slides. So this is... This was ah okay. So this is my um, one slide summary on numerical relativity. What is numerical relativity? Is the art of solving Einstein equation on a computer, and in fact, it is made of these four building blocks. Uh, so on one end, you need a good uh, formulations of, of general relativity, even with some coordinate, and you need formulation of the matter fields, especially if you want to do astrophysics. Uh, a very important part, this is what we will talk about today, a very important part is, as I said, the uh, choice of coordinate. Uh, here the difficulties, one of the difficulties is the fact that to do interesting simulation you want to handle singularity, formation of black holes, movement of black holes, and so on and so forth. This is also something that uh, I will discuss quite in detail. Uh, again, basics, using basic argument, but I will discuss it quite in detail. And then, of course, once you have a satisfying uh, formulation on the mathematical side, um, you uh, have to apply some numerical methods. So the numerical methods that are nowadays used are uh, relatively standard, but they are combined and adapted specifically to some of the problems that um, uh, we are interested in, in gravitational wave physics and astrophysics, for example. So. There's something special that we do. I will not talk uh, about this, since probably this is not the most uh, important, um, the, the most important part or the uh, most interesting part for this audience. And finally, but this is last but not least, uh, um, nowadays you need to handle with technology. Uh, so you need to know how to write complex code and they have to run on state-of-art uh, machines with multiple processors and so on. Uh, this is an entire... Uh, there's a lot of work in, the, in that direction, especially today. So for what comes out today, we will focus on the first uh, two pillars later. And now I will go with a brief, uh, very brief uh, historical introduction, mostly based on this result. So for many years, the uh, holy grail of the field was to be able to simulate on a computer the collision of two black hole. This was finally achieved. Uh, in um, early 2000, so this is published 2005, 2005 uh, actually by a single person, um, Franz Pretorius, that of course built a lot of work by many people that I'm going to talk about. Um, and you see here the main result, so what is shown in this plot uh, is the uh, Psi-4 scalar, so this is the vial or in vacuum Riemann uh, tensor contracted with a, uh, with a null tetrad, and this is what represents outgoing a gravitational wave if you are sufficiently far from an isolated source. Um, you see it's plotted at a given, um, at, at some different coordinate radii of, um, in the simulation domain at a, um, a given inclination and a, as a function of time. And what you see is this typical oscillation that corresponds to the emission from say the last orbit, the merger and the ring down of this uh, final black hole. So this paper I really suggest, in this column especially, there's a list of uh, uh, mathematical and numerical aspects that actually made this simulation possible. Uh, and it's a nice summary of uh, all the things that we use and develop in um, numerical relativity. The main finding was, of course, uh, uh, the wafer, uh, and in particular, to identify a smooth transition between what is called the spiral, merger, and, and ring down regime. So this type of simulation were, you know, um, uh, wanted since a long time. Many people argued the need of this simulation for 
uh, for a long time, especially to clarify the high velocity uh, regime of, of, of the dynamics. And one of the things that this simulation and others did was to uh, verify and confirm a prediction uh, made here um, about, uh, about the waveform, which was predicted five years before um, in this paper, which I think everybody knows. <laughs> um, nowadays, there's uh, uh, thousands, actually, of this simulation of different length, different quality, different orbits even, uh, different mass ratio, and so on and so forth. So this is one, of, this is actually a snapshot from a video which you can see on YouTube. I don't want to project it here um, just because of technical reason. Uh, <coughs> but what you see, what you see in, the, in, in, in this calculation, in the simulation, is actually a very long waveform with respect to the one of, of Pretorius. This is the strain, it's not Psi 4, it's the real, it's the, real, it's the actual strain. So uh, Psi 4 is a second derivative of this, uh, of, this, um, of this quantity. You see there are many, many orbits, but the same qualitative um, behavior, so transition in spiral, uh, Measuring down the quasi-circular case. <coughs> Another thing that you see in this in this plot uh, are these balls, black black balls. These are the apparent horizon calculated during the simulations, um, and you see also a, a, a colored color map uh, from blue to, to to red. This is the lapse function, actually, which we will discuss in a second, and this is a quantity that uh, uh, tells how uh, fast. Uh, the, the times flows, so is a, a sort of measure at least visually uh, or far away from, uh, from the source of the actual gravitational field. And yeah, this type of simulation of course were very <laughs> helpful because uh, uh, the moment that the signal was detected uh, in 2015, one could immediately recognize it. And, so I, 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 remember, I remember you that um, to see, th this, sig this signal can be seen actually in the data. You don't need, so we do use sophisticated methods for that analysis of the signal. But especially for this uh, event, you don't need uh, very complicated um, filters and procedures on the data to actually see. Th this is almost the data that has been that has been detected, and uh, of course, when people saw this, it was, was clear what this was. This was clearly predicted uh, before, and so clearly rec recognizable. And nowadays, this, this simulation help enormously uh, to detect and precisely estimate the, the, the property and the parameters of these binary black hole sources, or in general, compact binary sources. So the actual story started long ago. This is, I think, the first paper that did something uh, with, super, with computers, supercomputer, 1964. Han and, and, and Lindquist, where they actually try in axis symmetry to uh, collide two black holes by solving Einstein equation. Uh, this is the conclusion of, of the paper. Uh, so uh, in some sense, the first is the last. Um, the numerical solution of the Einstein equation presents no insurmountable difficulties. Uh, so, of course, much remains to be done, and here they discuss stability of the equation, proofs, mathematical proofs uh, of uh, the scheme that they were using, coordinate conditions, so exactly the thing that we are discussing today, uh, and also mention that uh, at the time uh, there was a limitation in, in computer power, uh, and they could actually evolve for very, very little, this, uh, this simulation. This is a 50M simulation into the 50 points times 150 points. So something that today uh, is, is, can be done on a laptop. At the time, they used this computer. This was uh, one of the first uh, uh, computer made of, of uh, transistors. And it is uh, a sort of, uh, it's actually a very famous computer. Uh, I have here a list of many things have been done uh, in, in, the, in science, in the society in general, with this computer. So it had a quite, a, uh, it was produced in, in I think, thousands uh, pieces. 
and all over the world. And it was used, for example, by NASA for the Mercury and the Gemini missions to calculate orbits and so on, instead of having humans doing it. Um, it was used by scientists at UCLA to, 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 to solve the classical three-body problem, numerically. Um, it was used by engineers at Carl Zeiss to design uh, a 50, uh, 50 millimeter lens, which is kind of largest lens for photography um, ever done, or well, in any case at the time, definitely one of the biggest lens. And with this lens, uh, Kubrick shot scenes of Barry Lyndon. And this, uh, uh, which, you know, open, open view and so on, and this uh, computer was also in Kubrick's uh, Doctor Strangelove, if you check carefully um, the, um, some images, it, it's part of it. And uh, uh, m m music fans might know who's uh, Xenakis, a uh, composer um, that worked here in Paris, and he built uh, one of his, composed one of his pieces here, not, not here, but in Paris, with this computer, so electronic music at the early stage. We will come back to computer at the very end, I will say something. Um, then the story went on. Uh, this is also considered a milestone in the, in the, in the, um, uh, in the field work of Larry's Mark from his PhD, PhD uh, thesis to actual um, his group, um, uh, where it, they managed to have actual collision of two black holes. So this is a on collision. Um, thing then improved, this is 93. And if you look the gap between these two, uh, the time gap between these two paper, thought that there was nothing in between. There were many, many, many uh, there are many, uh, many papers and many works on, in this direction, but it took time. And of course, computer also became more powerful. Uh, then people moved to 3D. Um, this is the first uh, uh, 3D simulation where, uh, uh, Bern Brugman attempted uh, mergers in 3D, uh, grazing collision in 3D, okay, from the a AI group at the time, <coughs> and uh, also the first orbit which appears now uh, <coughs> by a uh, group of, of uh, Bern Brugman at uh, P uh, Penn State. So slowly things improved, as not only as computer improved, but also as the formalism improved. So in all these papers, the formalism is slightly different and improved on top of each other. Um, shortly after Pretorius, uh, there were these two papers that came out uh, to, together. Uh, so they use completely different technique with respect to what Pretorius did, but now this is one of the two main techniques used in, in our simulation nowadays. Um, and uh, this is again a uh, few orbit binary black hole merger with a very robust technique called the puncture method, which we will talk about today, and really based on uh, a technique which does not use excision. So um, here black holes are handled in a particular way, which we will discuss, which does not need complicated numerical technique to remove the interior of the, of the, of the black holes. And that dates back to work of uh, Bowen York. <coughs> okay, here is my plan. Here it is. So, uh, as I said, I will mostly focus on summarizing the equation. In particular, I summarize 3 plus 1 decomposition of general relativity, um, which is the basis to start um, thinking about the Cauchy problem in, in, in general relativity. Then I will discuss um, the initial data problem, so solving the constraint, just determining the initial data, which is a non very non-trivial one, very complicated one. And here the particular equation that I will present is one of the two um, ways that we know nowadays are working, and it's called conformal traceless, transfer traceless uh, decomposition. Uh, and this gives me the opportunity to talk about puncture, explain what punctures are, how they evolved, why they, why they work. Um, then I talk briefly about the evolution problem. Uh, I will explain why we can use free evolution uh, and how the main uh, system of equation are, are built, at least uh, the, the, the logic. Uh, and then I will spend some time on gate choice, so tell 
uh, how uh, we actually manage to uh, have a singularity on a computer. Uh, this is not my work at all. Uh, there are excellent book and, and, and lecture notes uh, from which I have myself learned. Um, I would uh, suggest this, um, this four from, from which also the, the talk is, is basically based. If you are interested in original papers, um, there are many but not so many. I managed to collect, I think, many of them, almost, uh, I would say, almost all the important ones. You can find them on this, uh, this link. Okay, now I need to use the blackboard. Okay, let me start from here. And the first topic would be uh, 3 plus 1 decomposition. of GR. And we start for, from kinematic. So we start from, we work in four dimension, three plus one. Uh, I always will use this cartoon of our manifold. So this is our space-time M, our metric GAB. I use AAB and they go from uh, A, B, C and so on. And they go uh, from 0 to 3. And well, the signature is minus plus plus in all the equation. I won't do any derivation, but uh, just to, 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 to mention this. So this is the starting point. Imagine this is a uh, four-dimensional space-time. And actually, the starting point of, of all of this is to make an assumption on this space-time and ask the space-time to be globally hyperbolic. This is an important assumption. It means that there is a Cauchy, Cauchy surface in this, um, in, this, in, in, in this manifold. And what it implies is that this uh, space-time can be foliated. Let's do them yellow. Can be foliated in space-like hypersurfaces. Okay. And uh, um, these surfaces are typically identified by T, scalar functions. And so if you have the scalar function, you can take the gradient of it and you can build a, no a normal to it by adding a normalization constant. This normalization constant, alpha, which is uh, precisely uh, introduced to normalize the normal the normal vector um, of, of this um, that determines this uh, space-like hypersurface, which then is, is time-like, is called the lapse function. And it's what you, s you saw before, uh, what you saw before in this colored, colored plot. And we will talk a, a lot about this, okay? So this uh, uh, observer that uh, are attached to this uh, uh, n vector field are called uh, Eulerian observer. And it's what, what we actually have in our simulation. So we'll, we'll, the coordinates that we use and that we will introduce in the simulation are associated to this, um, to this observer. So you can, you can think physically of this uh, um, yellow surface, space-like surface, as the simultaneity uh, surface uh, associated to this, to this observer. This observer has an uh, acceleration, and I, I want to give here the, an exp uh, the expression. It's the user acceleration formula. And later I will put something here, which will be useful when we, uh, when we discuss the, uh, the, the gauge. And 
One introduced at this point also uh, something called M, which is just alpha N. This is sometimes called time vector or uh, normal evolution vector. Sometimes it is indicated with T, but then you have too many T. Um, and it's easy to see that this is the vector that uh, some sense generates the, the time evolution, in the sense that if you uh, take another, another of these hypersurfaces, so by the way, these hypersurfaces are not intersecting, so uh, you have many of them, you stack one on, on top of the other, and um, you build the space time in, in that way. And it's easy to see that this is the vector that brings point from uh, one hypersurface T of level set T, value T, to the next T plus dt. Okay? Essentially by in the way it is by the way it is uh, by the in, by the way it is defined. Okay? So one what one says is that sigma t, these hypersurfaces, are lead direct. Uh, by the time evolution vector, which is this m. Okay. So the, it means that the lead derivative in this direction is the thing that um, produces, in some sense, uh, the, evolu the e evolution. So it's your uh, time derivative. Okay. Then here, you, one uses standard theory of em embeddings and so on, identify things. I'm not. I'm skipping all of that. But essentially, in sigma, you have an induced metric uh, from G, so from the, from the, uh, um, from the bending space M. So sigma is a 3D space, uh, M and G induce on sigma gamma, which uh, can be expressed in terms of uh, G and this N vector in this way. And associated to this, of course, you will have uh, uh, a connection, covariant derivative, in the sigma uh, surfaces. You will have a Riemann curvature, that is the uh, commutator of this, uh, of, this, um, of this connection, and you will have all the, all the tensor that comes from the um, contraction of Riemann. So, for example, uh, the Ricci, which is what we are interested in. So this you can think about as the intrinsic curvature. Sometimes you don't need to specify intrinsic, it's the curvature of sigma, but sometimes it's called intrinsic because there's another curvature which I'm, I'm introducing, um, which I'm introducing soon. This other curvature, it's called extrinsic Curvature is indicated often, or at least uh, recently everywhere, with uh, K, KB, and it is defined. Ah, this is something that I have to uh, tell you, but it is defined in this way. <coughs> Where uh, this object here is called the orthogonal projector, so it's the thing that uh, allows you to uh, uh, calculate projection into spatial hypersurfaces. And um, the meaning of this object it basically tells you how the sigma uh, surface is, is, is curved in the embedding space. So if you think now in um, 2D and this is your embedding space, and you take this surface um, into the space, then what this thing measures is basically how the uh, surface change, or how the n vector, the normal vector, change the, uh, the moment that you move it, uh, that you move it uh, along, along the surface. Okay, so in this case would be, with this convention, this would be a case of positive curvature, and another case uh, would be a case of negative 
curvature, where now this K, I really mean the trace of it. But <coughs> we will come back to that. Okay. So, will what? you use some indices IJ in space at some point? Or yes. Or you want to confuse I, us with space? No, I, mean I will use them. I will use them later. But I think it's, it's, uh, it's interesting to have this because this projector gives you a way to, to have to extend tensor again back from the sigma to m. So you don't need immediately, there's no need, I think it's a clever thing, there's no need to introduce special, which I'm doing now, <laughs> but there's no need to introduce special coordinate and so on. You can actually, using this projector, um, provi this projector provides the um, um, reverse maps from the pullback and the pushback. So uh, you can actually extend and consider these objects that uh, in four dimensions. And this is actually useful when you do things. Um, this NABLA is, of course, the four dimensional uh, covariant derivative. So let me put it here. Uh, yeah, so this K is the trace of K A B. Here we are running from zero to four. Yeah. And how many ends? Then? How many? How many ends normal? It's it's a it's a field. The field, but one field or yeah, it's it's one field. It's one. It's a hypersurface. Yeah. There is a one surface, yes. three to two four. Right? So zero to embedding C to four, three dimension to four dimension. Yes, this is three dimensional. The yellow and the other is this is four dimensional. Um, okay, coordinate. So what you can do, and what we need to do, is let me change color. Uh, no. Uh, Let's do blue, <laughs> yes. Um, what you can do is to introduce coordinate. So these are called adapted coordinate. Uh, because they're the obvious ones. So you can take T as your time coordinate. And then here you can introduce a coordinate Xi on the, uh, on the hypersurface. Uh, those that you want. So associated to this coordinate, you will have the basis. X. It's fine. This is fine. This, it's fine. We don't need the actual to put it. Um, I will never use uh, mu indexes or for, or uh, other type of. Um, so this gives a natural basis for the uh, for the vector fields. And uh, in this uh, in this basis, one can show. Um, no, sorry, I have to say something else. Yes. So if you have this, um, if you have this basis, you see that the dt uh, the dt vector. This is the vector that is tangent to the lines of um, constant coordinate. Okay, so it's a vector uh, that is somewhere here. And this vector is in general given by uh, the n vector, but it can have, in general, a component uh, that is space-like. Okay, so this would be the dt vector. Okay, where? Uh, which is space-like, so beta is, is space-like, okay? So now there's a second quantity together with alpha, which is called beta, and it is space-like, which essentially tells you here uh, uh, how the dt vector and the, and the normal evolution vector dif differ. If you use this coordinate, this is called shift vector, Yeah. 
if you use this coordinate, the metric uh, gamma, uh, well, the, the metric, the line element, let's, let's do this, is uh, minus alpha squared dt squared plus um, uh, gamma j. Here now I'm using spatial indexes, so ij go uh, k and so on from 1 to 3 dxi plus beta i dt dxj plus beta j dt okay so this is the the form uh, of the metric that you have and here you start to see what is the what i mentioned before so the meaning of the lapse uh, is to the, uh, determine how the proper time uh, flows for the Eulerian observer so our simulation, we are, we are a Eulerian observer and um, we will see we can choose the labs. By choosing the labs, we tell how the proper time flows. Uh, and similarly, the beta is another uh, gauge quantity uh, that precisely tells something about how coordinates, in some sense, move from one um, hypersurface to, to the next one. Okay. So this is more or less mo all the basic definitions. And let me stress that I didn't talk about Einstein equation at all. So this is a general construction that does not involve a GR. Hmm? Uh, but there's a relation that is purely uh, kinematical. Here, that essentially uh, can be found uh, ge ge geometrically from um, working, on this, uh, working on this equation here. And what one finds, this is our first, uh, let's say, useful uh, equation. Let's write it with uh, um, these indexes. And let's give it the number, one. So this relation tells that the lead derivative along the, the, the m vector, the, the evolution vector, of the, of the tree metric is essentially related to the e extrinsic curvature. So this is the kinematic relation that connects uh, the tree metric, which is our variable, with this velocity. And at this point, one introduces GR. So now, and start to use Einstein field equation. And how? Well, you take, for instance, um, uh, the Einstein tensor in four dimensions, and you start to project it. Okay, and you can project it, for instance, um, twice along the normal direction. You can project it once along the normal direction and once um, along uh, the uh, in, in, in the spatial direction. Or you can, produ can project it twice in the uh, spatial direction. Okay. In doing in, in, in doing this work, one uses geometrical identity that are called Gauss, uh, Kodazzi, and Ricci identities. And by doing this calculation, which is not difficult, but long, um, one can systematically translate uh, Einstein field equation in, in this formalism. What you obtain... And G is the notation for the Einstein tensor, which G minus 1. Yes, yes. Oh. Einstein tensor, which minus the trace. Yes. If you have one function, it's uh, defined by the extrinsic, uh, this curvature, or by intrinsic? This rel relates the uh, four dimensions. Yes, embedding so on to other. This relates. Those are the conditions for embedding. Yes, they relate the four dimensional Riemann with the three dimensional Riemann and extrinsic curvature. And then you have contractions. You take contraction. And you effectively have a relation between the four dimensional Ricci. But these are the ones that you need. The four-dimensional Ricci, the three-dimensional Ricci, and the extrinsic curvature. So these are identities that one can use. The same, no? no, 
there are relations. They, they are precisely established. They are geometric relation precisely established by. So the equation the establishing connection. Yes. But, uh, and then you use Einstein equation on top of it. And what you find is that this particular uh, projection gives you an equation of this type. This is the three-dimensional Ricci scalar. This is the square of the extrinsic curvature. Then you have a term uh, like that. And then if you have matter, you have the uh, projection of the uh, stress energy tensor along the, the observer, so you have the energy. And this thing, uh, we call it C0, for a reason that will be clear soon. And you use Newton's constant equal 1? Yes, everywhere. <laughs> also C. Um, um, then another... K is the trace of Kij. Yes, the K is the trace of Kij. Um, another equation that you find is this. This is, would be the projection one normal direction one sp and one spatial. And again, here, if you have a stress energy tensor and you do this uh, uh, for the matter and you do this projection, what you find here uh, is that the linear momentum density. So we call it P. And this uh, right hand side, we call it C1, again, for a reason that will be clear. The last one is an equation for the time derivative, now uh, this Lie derivative along M and so on, we simply call it time derivative in quote. Um, the time derivative of K, this is a bit long equation, but has the shape. It has the shape where um, this is two covariant derivative of the laps. This is the three Ricci uh, tensor. The trace again, Kij, this contraction. And this is the, the, the matter term where Sij is the uh, full spatial projection of the Timuno, so it's the stress tensor. Okay. And Z is a notation for. <laughs> yeah. um, so, Let's number this equation. I will call this equation um, 2. Let's call this equation 3 and 4 because they will return uh, again and again. Okay? Maybe you can write M uh, on this blackboard because it's lost in the shadows of the evolution vector M. It's here. Okay. Um, so what are these equations? Uh, so first of all, you see that there are only two sets of equations, the number one and number two, that involves this LM, so that involves time derivative. So these are equations that tells you somehow how this tensor changed from one sigma t and one sigma t plus dt. But there are also equations, three and four, that do not involve, that involve only quantities on sigma. So these things are called C, because these are constraint equations. Okay, in particular, C0 is the Hamiltonian constraint, and this is the momentum one. So they are uh, given on, on sigma. In particular, uh, yeah, this is the divergence of K. This is something to remember. The momentum is the, di uh, the divergence of K. Okay? So this decomposition, which again is standard, highlights that uh, the, the equations are actually made of in terms of evolution, <coughs> constraints, and evolution equations. So you don't have, so it, it's something that is present, for instance, also in electromagnetism. The structure is similar. What it means is that you have, uh, what it means, what this equation dictates is that you, you may have initial data here, sigma zero, okay? This sigma, this sigma zero have to satisfy constraints. And then you can think about evolving 
uh, these constraints further uh, in time using, for instance, the other two, the other two equation. Um, how these equations are called? So in the numerical relativity community and in the uh, and now by sort of osmosis also in the gravitational community, these are often referred as uh, ADM equations. So Arnold Desert Misner. Uh, there is also a date, I think, 62, or in any case, the 60s. So this author, uh, what they did, were they looking for a uh, Hamiltonian formulation of GR. Uh, if you look at this paper, you find equations that are equivalent to this, but not these ones. So this um, uh, equation in particular, the use of, uh, of, of k variable uh, is due to York, I think 72 or 79, I don't remember. So this is really the use of, of kij. So in the Hamiltonian formulation, you have conjugate momenta, pij, that are related to this k, but they are not exactly the same thing. Um, I'm doing this now because I know that Ivo really cares about this. <laughs> That's why I left this little space here, because this equation were not invented here, uh, were invented before. And, and they appear in uh, mathematical analysis of general relativity that was performed, of course, by French mathematician. Um, and so they go back to work of uh, uh, Darmois, pr pronounced correctly, uh, Lichnerovich and Shoke uh, Bruhat. So this is 20, 30s, uh, 40s, more or less. Okay, so these works focused exactly on what we are focusing now. So can we solve uh, GR as a Cauchy problem? And they found this sort of equations, they uh, analyzed them, they proved at some point uh, um, uh, local existence and uniqueness, and they actually wrote down this type of equation. And then uh, they were refound uh, from Hamiltonian and so on and so forth and developed. Sorry, sorry, but uh, is there, are there conditions on the coordinate choices to preserve uniqueness well possible? Like, are you making some? This I will say something later, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, PDE, so now these are written, uh, sort of mixed uh, notation, but you see that they would naturally translate it to PDE because the, uh, the lead derivative here, if you make this coordinate transformation, the lead derivative along M, this would be the partial derivative uh, with respect to this uh, time, uh, plus um, uh, minus, sorry, yes. Uh, L, L beta, which is some derivative, covariant derivative of beta. Hmm? So the uh, left hand side of this, they actually become uh, PD, PD, uh, time, time, um, yeah, time derivative. Okay? And similarly here, this big D and, and, and inside the, uh, the Ricci here, you have covariant derivative, so you have a partial derivative. And in particular, you see you have first derivative here and there in time. You have second derivative in space here. Uh, second derivative, in, these, these are second derivative in space. These are first derivative in space of this uh, velocity variable of this extrinsic curvature. So it does become a sort of a PD system in the, uh, in the way that, uh, say, mathematician uh, or you think about. Hmm? And in particular, if you look at this one, this would be x dot equal v, and this would be v dot uh, equals some second derivative of x. Mm, so it would be first order in time, second order in space. And similar, this would be second order in space, so something that, in case that you're lucky, uh, might become something like an elliptic equation. So this is the uh, PD uh, structure. So precisely what these people did here, that's why I kept it to the end. Eh? <laughs> Um, they looked at this type of Cauchy problem, and this type of Cauchy problem is difficult because of various things. First of all, this is nonlinear. 
Uh, second of all, there are constraint equation. And third of all, you have the complication of the coordinate, that if you want an explicit form of equation with coefficients and functions and so on, you do need to make a choice of, of coordinate. Okay? So all these things makes this problem, I would say, rather unique, at least for a physicist. Uh, despite this, um, despite this, uh, results uh, exist, and in particular, <coughs> um, looking at the date, uh, 52, right? uh, 1952, uh, Shukebuha uh, prove. existence and uniqueness is a local result. There are stronger results later uh, uh, in time, so local in time, uh, of this equation using harmonic coordinate, which I will uh, in, in, in introduce um, later. So we can discuss perhaps this a bit uh, later, since I will come back to this. Um, the thing that I wanted to highlight that is an important, uh, that is an important, okay, then I have to use that, okay. <laughs> uh, the thing that uh, I wanted to highlight here is that uh, one may ask, we know that in electromagnetism, if we have, uh, uh, if we have uh, uh, constraint, this constraint propagates along the dynamics. So you can solve them at the beginning and then in principle you don't care. Hmm? because they remain, con they conserve, that they, uh, that there are different ways of expressing this. The question, or they can say they are closed. The question is, if I have C, how do I call it, A, um, equals zero, T equals zero, then does this imply uh, that C, A equals zero for uh, other times? And the answer is yes. So this is a similar property to the uh, equation of electromagnetism, for example. I wanted to sketch one way to see it. So one can do the calculation, calculate the evolution equation for the constraint. But there's a nice way to see it. And uh, it's the following. So take in vacuum <coughs> Einstein equation. But not Einstein equation, we take an extended system uh, made in this way. Okay, where this is the symmetric, this is the symmetric, symmetrized covariant derivative of a vector field Z. Okay, so this is a GR if Z is zero. Okay, if Z is not zero, what you get from the three plus one decomposition of this uh, uh, of this thing. is something like equation one that remains like that. It's a kinematical, uh, it's a kinematical um, equation. Then you have an equation for uh, the evolution uh, of K, so the equivalent of equation two, which is the right-hand side uh, of two plus uh, a term of this type. Again, this is symmetrized. Then you have uh, two more equations, the tar time evolution equation. So this theta is the projection of z along the normal direction, and this is the spatial component of theta. This equation is the constraint, the Hamiltonian constraint. So the right hand side of this is the uh, Hamiltonian constraint, plus there are terms uh, that are in, in the vector za. Okay. And similarly, the time derivative of this zi vector is the momentum constraint plus terms uh, in zi. Okay, so this would be the equivalent of three and four in the extended system. Okay. And then what one can do here is to use Bianchi identity. And show that the Bianchi identity imply for z, uh, for the z vector, uh, such an equation.
This is a linear wave equation for Z, which means that if you start from uh, Z A equals zero, and his time derivative, let me write it this way, equals zero. So if you start actually from Einstein, uh, you have the zero solution. And so this is the way to show or understand that uh, constraint propagates, or that they are close along the dynamics, the statement that I've made here. Uh, this technique is not at all uh, due to GR. So uh, in recent times, this is called um, the Z4 formulation. Um, Bona et al. call it like, like that. But in other, it's known in other literature, uh, they are called lambda systems. Uh, so it takes different name. I will call it Z4 because it's something that we've used. But it's, it's a known technique to deal with this type of things. And uh, an example is another thing that we use in, in, in numerical relativity. If you look at If you look at ideal, so uh, MHD, hmm, magneto hydrodynamics, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in flat space time, hmm, uh, the equations are e e equation for the, um, you have only equation for the magnetic field. And you have this type of equations. You have this type of evolution equation plus a constraint, which is the divergence of B. Where do I put it? Here. Um, here. The divergence of B is equal to zero. So the structure is very similar. Evolution and constraint. So one way to solve, uh, actually numerically, uh, this equation is to say, well, here, I'm going to add the gradient of a certain variable, a new variable that I add. And um, if I do the math and so on, I can uh, transform the constraint in an evolution equation for this variable. And if I'm really, um, um, and if I'm really ambitious, I can also add, that he add, uh, add here as a, as a parameter a term like that. So what this, what this does, so this would be now our uh, constraint. Okay, so C equals zero is our constraint. In this extended formulation, which is called divergence cleaning, cleaning because it cleans the, di the divergence using an hyperbolic equation, um, then you can prove exactly the same thing uh, that happens there. So you can prove that the constraint solves um, a box type of equation. And if you have the damping term, um, well, if you have this kappa term, you precisely have this uh, uh, kappa term here. So this is C. And uh, similarly, uh, you have an, uh, uh, yeah, a wave equation for um, second order wave equation for the, for the, new, for the new field. Okay? So here you see you have the same situation. If you start from zero constraint, these are propagated. And if you are clever and add by hand, extending the system by hand with uh, such a term, you also have not only propagation of the constraint, but you have a damping term that is uh, controlled by this uh, parameter. Okay. Hmm. So it's completely standard and it is used. It is used as one of the two uh, uh, formulations that is, I think, most used uh, recently in the uh, fluid dynamics uh, literature, for example. Okay. Was it used before constraint damping was used in GR? So this is a paper, uh, the divergence cleaning paper. It is, I think, it is not very old. It is, uh, I think, the end of the 90s or maybe early, early 2000s. So it might be even up there. But if you look at that paper, there's no mention to GR. So it's really a computational physics paper where they, uh, they discuss different methods to uh, enforce the constraints. So they have some elliptic, of course, they solve the elliptic constraint or they make a parabolic or something that I will discuss again, because for the gauge, we do the same again. 
and um, and uh, uh, there's no mention to GR. These people, I think, do not um, do, did not know certainly the literature in GR. Uh, but he's, he's a super cited paper. It, it, um, okay. So what time is it, by the way? It's or better, uh, how much I have? Twenty-five. I have half an hour. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, so this should convince you. This argument, uh, it's very important, and this should convince you that uh, it's possible uh, to approach uh, the, pro the Cauchy problem by uh, first, uh, say, solving the constraint on a sigma zero, and then evolving them without caring about them, so only monitoring, for example, to check your numerical solutions or whatever, mm? in principle. This is one approach, it's called the free evolution approach. Uh, there are others approach. Of course, you could decide to solve the constraint every time. This is perfectly valid. Uh, but in any case, whatever you choose to evolve, at the beginning at least, you have to solve the constraint. So that brings us to the, our next topic, <laughs> which is uh, the initial data problem. So this you certainly have to do. An initial data problem is very simple. Uh, it's, if you want to put it in a line, it's find I, uh, K, uh, K, I, J, sorry, gamma I, J, K, I, J, uh, such that on sigma zero, such that the constraints are, are solved. So solve the constraint uh, for, um, for the main variable, position and velocity. Um, so I equation three and four. Equation three and four. So you see, equation three and four are four equations, and these are twelve components. So here, uh, it's this problem is difficult. One of the reasons why it's difficult is is again that, of course, you have uh, you have a nonlinear equation. You have, but also you have twelve components and and four constraints. In some sense, this means that you have freedom to choose eight quantities in the way that, that you want. So in general, this means you have free data. Some fields, some component can be freely specified, it's up to you, and uh, solved, let's call them solved uh, data where solved means these two equations. Okay. And this is now tough because, I mean, naively thinking, what do you do? You start to set component of a tensor to zero, solve for others. It's very un unintuitive what to do. Okay. So, of course, free data or, or in general, the constraints, what you would want. You would want to understand precise meaning for the fields in order to give a precise uh, uh, prescription of free data that corresponds to uh, what you expect astrophysically. So there is a, a solution that you are looking that has no gravitational wave. You, want, you would like to specify free data in such a way it has no gravitational wave. There is a solution that you know has certain uh, symmetry. You would like to specify free data according to those symmetry and so on and so forth. Um, so this is the first uh, require, general requirement. You need uh, uh, physical meaning. You need to find a way to associate uh, the choice of free data to the physical meaning that you have to give uh, to these solutions. And the other one is, of course, it's, there's, there's a mathematical necessity. Because uh, if you now write this equation down it, as a PDE, these are very complicated PDEs, which you definitely don't find in the books. So we need to know, uh, we need to specify the free data, another requirement which is uh, also very important in such a way, the equation that we have, we can solve them and we know that there's one solution that exists, it's unique and so on. This is a very complicated problem. And the way it has been solved, again, um, this is work, again, uh, Nitschnerovich and colleagues, uh, so started long ago. Uh, is introduce a certain formalism. So you don't use them this way, you have to manipulate the equations. Um, in particular, to use conformal decomposition. So 
this has been found a very powerful way to uh, solve the initial data and later also to uh, for the free evolution problem but let's start from this so conformal decomposition what this means it means that you don't solve for gamma ij but you go introduce new variables rewrite the equation in terms of these variables so what are these variables these variables are um, a conformal factor which is taken with this power times a conformal metric this now becomes the two uh, new variables and similarly the uh, extrinsic curvature uh, is taken as a traceless part a ij plus uh, the trace piece k is the trace as before with a i j upper uh, conformally decompose again with the same conformal factor and introducing a conformal uh, piece of this this is this p is taken typically as a minus 4 or minus 10 depending on the situation okay this is fixed to minus 4 because it Thibault explained it the other day the reason is actually leads the equation that we, we, will, we will discuss next. Um, this P is chosen based on the particular formulation that you want of the initial data problem. And it is better sometimes to choose uh, P to the minus P minus 4 if you use certain equation or P minus 10 if you use other equation. The reason is that once you plug in everything into the equation, you find terms that appear like A tilde P minus 4 or 10, depending on the equation, then you want to throw away that. Um, so you start from that, and now that there's a long thing that we completely skip. Okay, so you have to plug in everything inside the equation, take traces, re rewrite 3 and 4. The solution for uh, the, uh, 3 is, um, let, let me do it here. So it's three, let's call it 3a, so it's still the Hamiltonian constraint, right? But there's another equation now, um, and is uh, written. So of course, this gamma tilde as a, as a, as a, uh, as a zone covariant derivative associated. Uh, so you write an equation that is of this type. This, I think it's too long to write here. Um, okay. You have, of course, a Ricci of the covariant matrix, so a Ricci tensor, so you have a Ricci scalar, that, that's him. Um, plus, minus. This is again the trace plus 2 pi e equals 0. Okay, so this is again the Hamiltonian constraint, now rewritten in terms of the conformal uh, variable, the conformal factor in particular, and the, con and the other conformal variable. And, uh, uh, and here is for p equal uh, 10 minus 10. But the difference is only here. Uh, okay, this is called li now Lichnerovich equation, which is still a Hamiltonian constraint. Mm -hmm. And this is really important. So this is an important equation that is, is crucial to then solve things as we all the things that we solve uh, are related to this equation. Then the, um, um, the next step actually depends. So there are two methods that are known and or, or, that are used, let's say. One is called um, conformal, so CTT, which means uh, conformal 
um, transverse and traceless. And another that is called CTS, which is called conformal thin a sandwich, like the sandwich. Both use the Lichnerovich equation, but uh, they have then different ways of expressing the momentum constraint. So we will do only CTT because we have uh, not much space, or not much time. So for CTT, what you do is to say, well, I have this decomposition of the extrinsic curvature. I have an A tilde with minus 10. And my A tilde up, yes. I imagine it as made of two pieces, a longitudinal one and uh, transverse traceless. So by definition, this guy is uh, traceless with the conformal metric. Huh? And uh, you also demand that his divergence uh, conformal uh, is, is zero. So this is what you demand. Okay. And then you say, well, and then I have this other piece. So why you demanded this, by the way? Because you want an equation for, for the momentum. Hmm? So the momentum in this variable is something that will be the divergence of this guy. So if you take the divergence of this guy and you have a, tra a, transverse, uh, uh, you have a transverse piece, you are dealing only with the longitudinal part in your momentum. And you, you are free to choose the, the, the transverse part, for example. So the, the, the longitudinal part Okay. The longitudinal part, uh, AIJL, is given, or is, uh, I tell you in what sense is given in a second, through uh, a vector X uh, and a linear operator, which is defined in this way. IJ, yes. Okay, so this thing is called, um, so you see, it's a linear operator in D, in D tilde, um, um, but it's not just the, the, the D tilde. This, this thing here is called conformal, a killing operator. And it's defined by this thing here. So it's called like this because the kernel of this is a, is a, is a conformal, is the definition of the conformal killing back. Um, and how do you find it or how do you operate w with it? Uh, well, given uh, a i j, you take the divergence. And this will be, uh, will be given by the divergence of this L tilde ij, okay? which is an object like this. Where is it? I. J plus, uh, conform, this is the conformal now Ricci. And this is usually indicated as um, la, uh, Laplace symbol, L uh, tilde uh, uh, downstairs applied to Xi. So this is sometimes called conformal vector Laplacian because it's the Laplacian, but with this, um, from, from this conformal operator and uh, applied to a vector. Hmm? So once you have a tilde, you can take the divergence and you can attempt to solve this equation to define x. Hmm? And so fortunately this is possible. So in certain conditions this, this equation has been studied and in certain conditions this equation has uh, unique uh, has solutions that are also unique. In particular for what constant 
I would say almost all the um, numerical relativists. Uh, there's a theorem, uh, Cantor, I think, 79, which says that uh, if you have asymptotically flat conditions, so asymptotically flat space time, so, so some slice sigma that goes to the uh, asymptotically to, uh, to, to, mean to, to, to the flat, to the flat, that's not Minkowski, it's three, Euclidean. Uh, it's the Euclidean, uh, three, three, three thing, and you have correct decays of the, um, of the of the of the gamma of the metric and of the extrinsic curvature in particular you need also uh, for for this theorem apparently you need to um, require also some strong condition decay condition on the on the metric so the second derivative of the metric has to be order has to decay like one over r to the, the third power hmm? so for instance there are many other theorems, actually there are reviews that uh, um, list what is available and uh, what has been done. But this is the relevant case, I think, for at least the simulation that I showed before. Uh, so here, the solution of this existing is unique. So it means that the composition exists and you can use it. Then, we, together with your 4A, what you do, as I said before, you take, you take the divergence and you use the uh, you use the momentum constraint. Okay, this is stuck. Um, and what you find is that you find an equation which we call for a, and that is uh, this operator here. It's an equation that can be interpreted as an equation for x. That would be the uh, most natural uh, thing. Uh, this is the epsilon six delta i k minus. 2 pi pi, which has to be there because uh, it's the matter term. And this is your uh, uh, momentum constraint, so c i equals 0. So 4a and 3a are the new, are the new 4 equation for the constraint. If you want in a line, C T T is what? Is uh, 3A and, and 4A. These are the equations that you want to solve. And in this case, what do you want to take? Well, if you look at this equation, it's quite natural to consider this kind of elliptic, well, they are elliptic operator uh, for X and Psi. So in this case, your free data can be naturally chosen as the conformal metric, the uh, uh, transverse traceless part of the conformal uh, extrinsic curvature uh, traceless part, <laughs> uh, and uh, k, and the matter term. But then we set them to zero, so we don't care. Uh, but you solve uh, for uh, psi. 3a and xi. Why this should give a better handle? Well, there are mathematical properties of this equation that are interesting. Um, there is also uh, results by York that identify, uh, for instance, in the equivalent class of conformal metric, the degrees of freedom of uh, gravitational waves, roughly said. So, roughly said, Controlling this variable should help to specify the gravitational wave content, for example, of your um, s s uh, solution. Another thing is that it is also, we will see it, uh, it is also well known that uh, k, the trace of this, uh, um, the, trace, the trace of this extrinsic curvature, so the, the mean curvature, if you will, of this sigma, is a very good gauge condition. It is a, is, is a variable that allows you to impose very good gauge conditions. This we will discuss later. So these variables are actually much more intuitive than the, uh, than the initial variable. Okay, I finished the blackboards. And how much I have? You have 10 minutes. If 
you want, you can also. Okay, what I want to do is to take this equation and show you very simple cases where we can recover simple black hole solutions. Then I will discuss the evolution problem a little bit, very shortly, say how to arrive to the formulation that I used today, sketch, and then discuss a bit the gauge. So if you want a T, I think we can uh, stop here. Okay, thank you. Yes, so we have a T. Yes, you could have 10 minutes now and the G and T. Ah, but then I'm not sure if I can finish the, the black hole solutions. Okay. So, so I, prefer to stop. I, I think stop it's, it's, it's preferred I stop here and then yes. I have to cancel anyway. So. Yes. <laughs> okay, thanks.